please spay and neuter your stand users. Welcome back to Bizarre Podcast, Dogs Must Die. My name is Grant, you can call him Chip, and we are talking about episodes 25 and 26 of Stardust Crusaders as we begin the Stardust Crusaders in Egypt season of the, the anime adaptation of, of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. What a lot of people say is the, the better half of part three... It's the half with more Dio in it. Like it's the half with more Dio, for sure, yeah. <laughs> that counts for a lot. Uh-huh. So we start off right where we, we left off previous season here. with They're just, they're in Dezip, Dezip, Egypt, <laughs> the desert in Egypt. Dezipt is what people are calling it these days. <laughs> the, the, these Zoomers, they don't have time for all the syllables. Yeah. Uh, so yes, episode 25, Iggy the Fool and uh, Gebs and Duel, part one. <laughs> We get we get two stand users for in in this two parter here and a little nursery rhyme. Uh, uh, it, it starts with us in this this great big ocean of sand, uh, uh, and their little stinger for "Hey, we're back, motherfucker!" Mm-hmm. It is uh, the, this mobile camera that goes over the dunes and eventually finds our, our group of five stand users and and pulls into them and and wipes around them they are initially 3d models but as abdul's shoulder does a a wipe against the camera that's when they transition (laughs) into their their regular cell animation the cg models that they use every once in a while for certain shots like the the vampire horse race in part two and the and the models here they look so much like what those characters would look like if they were in a fighting game for the Dreamcast. <laughs> they got Dreamcast model look to them. I don't know what it is about it, but man, it makes me want to see that game mm-hmm, ex- mm-hmm. come into existence. And so th- this quick shot ends with uh, JoJo saying, it's about time. Bro, it's only been like five months. <laughs> I need my JoJo now. It took way longer to get to you from your grandpa than it took to, to get to you now than, you know, the last time we saw you. It's over. Okay, <laughs> you'll be fine. And with, with that little stinger from JoJo there, we go into the new opening for Stardust Crusaders. Is that the first time we've started a, a season or, or started something with the OP? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, usually you have to wait like a few episodes before. before At least you until that. the second, yeah. Yeah. So, so this one starts super moody, recapping Phantom Blood and Stills, but it is essentially mm-hmm. just the sequel to the first OP. It doesn't like reinvent the wheel. You know, it's very much in the same style, just showing new things. New desert environment, kind of like a clock motif with this one. There's lots of gears everywhere. Some of the transitions are like clock pendulums wiping across the screen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There, there's a lot of cool details. We'll we'll get in into this one much later on. Yeah, I like the song from the previous opening more than this one, but the visuals in this one are pretty good. And there's a dog in it. And there's a dog in it. Last OP hey. didn't have a dog in it. This OP also ends in a similar way to the previous one of JoJo punching the screen with Star Platinum, but it's from the reverse perspective. So now we're getting punched instead of seeing him punch yes. <laughs> from yes. behind him. You get a very brief glimpse of Dio right at the end of this OP. And you, you see JoJo turn around and like get into a big punching match with him. But mm-hmm. it's, 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 just, it's just like comic book onomatopoeia is at the end. So you can't even see the punches. <laughs> So, so back to the episode, there is a helicopter uh, hovering above, circling, looking for a place to land. Our heroes are in the dunes, standing near the, the bottom of a, a sheer cliff face that goes all the way up to, to these ruins that are not important. These ruins never come up. It's just a oh, bit no. of visual interest. <laughs> yeah. And Joseph was expecting this chopper. These are the uh, the guys that we saw at the end of the previous episode in, in the little cliffhanger there. Uh, these are guys from the Speedwagon Foundation. J- Joseph's been waiting for the these guys to come because they're here to deliver a new a new buddy, a new ally to the mm-hmm, group. Mm-hmm. They're being very vague. Avdol knows uh, who they're bringing, and he's not happy. Th- there's a lot of like build up like they are really trying to put over this new stand user at one point there is a a significant difference between the translation in the the subtitles and in the dub script 
Mm-hmm. In the the subtitles, uh, uh, they they just continue to to underline Avdol's past familiarity with this new stand user. Like, yeah, I knew him. Trust me. While mm-hmm. those same lines in the dub are are highlighting the the chance of friendly fire or, or <laughs> backstabbing or non specific dangers, you cannot. Avdol does not want this guy around. Like Avdol is sweating while saying this yes, stuff. Yes. <laughs> And I think it's not just because the desert's very hot. Both translations make those, you know, those two points through this conversation. It's just the difference of, you know, which one's 60, which one's 40, depending <laughs> on the, the, which one you're watching. J- Joseph, in, like, brings up his stand is the fool. The, that That's the tarot card he's got. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Polnareff is not intimidated at all because, like, well, that sounds like a dumb fucking card. <laughs> it's called the fool. How bad could it be? Uh, Araki's tarot card art for the fool is just his take on keep on trucking. <laughs> yeah, the, the, a guy with a very similar lean while he's he's walking mm-hmm, along mm-hmm. there, and yeah. with a little bindle, much like the traditional tarot card art is a guy with a bindle. Yeah. Uh, the the fool card stands for folly, mania, extravagance, intoxication, delirium, frenzy, and bereavement. Hmm. This fits. Like, I haven't seen much of The Fool, but, like, yeah, this describes The the Fool's user pretty square so far. (laughs) Yeah. Polnareff gets into a little bit of an argument with Abdul just because Abdul just keeps telling him, like, you really don't take this guy lightly. You cannot beat him. You (laughs) you can't beat him. Like... (laughs) And, and Paul Nuff just being a cocky asshole. Fucking Abdul has barely been alive to him, to <laughs> Polnareff. And Polnareff's already like grabbing him by the collar and going like, hey, buddy, fuck you. <laughs> like, fuck. Well, that's what you get for playing such a nasty trick on somebody. You lose all trust. You know what? Fair, fair. <laughs> <laughs> so the helicopter lands and two guys come out. It's the, the two guys from the Speedwagon Foundation. These are the coolest looking dudes from the Speedwagon <laughs> Foundation. That, like, for being just normal guys who are not important characters, they get drawn like they are important, very mm-hmm. important. Uh, and so when they get out, JoJo's seeing these guys look important. He goes, which one of you is the stand user? And they're like, neither. He's in the back. And they open up the back. And uh, uh, there is just sort of a tarp. Or, or a big coat or something covering up, I don't know, must be a real little guy, says Polnareff. <laughs> Who's this little guy? <laughs> Who's this little guy? He's like smacking the, the seat in the back, like, come on, little guy, come out. And when he does that, he slaps his hand into a big puddle of sticky liquid. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, what the fuck is this sticky liquid? Everyone else is immediately just like, dude, we've been telling you nonstop for the past three minutes. This guy will fuck you up. Do not antagonize him. Yeah, and before Polnareff can even register what they're saying, the stand user leaps out of the seat, and it's a really disgusting, ugly Boston Terrier. But you repeat yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, is this a cute, sweet little guy who is not that cute and certainly not sweet. <laughs> And he immediately jumps out onto Polnareff's face and starts tearing his hair out in clumps <laughs> because that's his hobby is to yeah. tear people's hair out in clumps and then fart on them. Yeah. He loves to fart on the face. It's it's time for the fart jokes in JoJo because <laughs> uh, we got a dog that likes to fart in people's faces. So here is the reveal that like isn't a reveal like this was in the the cliffhanger like hey watch out this dog's coming ever even if you don't know the dog you know it's the dog yeah there's no teaser like that for the manga of course so it's a little more of a actual shock uh, a reveal in that i should mention while this does this dog is like a boston terrier ish dog he looks real fucked up (laughs) (laughs) he has very strange eyes yes yes he does like how the different parts of JoJo have been animated to kind of reflect the art style of each part, or mm-hmm. at least the art style by the time it reached the end of its run in the manga, they do the same thing with Iggy here because Iggy gets drawn in multiple different ways throughout the manga. Yeah, yeah. So they and they reflect every different look of of Iggy. <laughs> uh, 
I, we're going to talk about the OVA briefly later for reasons. Calm down. Yeah, I love the way Iggy is drawn in the the '90s OVA version yeah. of this story because yes. he looks like an orc from the like '70s <laughs> Lord of the Rings uh, animation. Yeah, he's so fucking weird looking. He's that really... dog is singing. Where there's a whip, there's a way. <laughs> Yeah, he's really squat and stocky. His face is... <laughs> oh, he's so weird in the OVA. His little needle teeth. Yeah. Polnareff is really pissed off that Iggy just farted on his face. And that's why you can't beat him. His farts are too strong. Unbeatable. So Polnareff is going to uh, immediately try to teach the dog a lesson by stabbing him <laughs> with Silver Chariot. Iggy... Uh, just like backflips off of Polnareff's face and uh, pulls out his stand, the fool. Who is a mecha chicken car. <laughs> yeah. Made of made of sand. <laughs> this stand looks like if you took rat trap from beast machines. Yes. And just swap the head out with a weird, it, with like a metallic kind of chicken head with big sunglasses. <laughs> Those sunglasses that old people have to wear that have, have eyesight problems, like those. And it is made of sand. Could and, it look yeah. like anything? I don't know. We may learn in the future. But it, it, that's what it looks like today, for sure. It, it is one of the wackiest looking stands. Like the, the fucking eight or nine feathers that are sticking out of the... <laughs> like Almost like a mane around its neck or the yes. top of its head. It's so weird. Uh, Jojo is impressed uh, uh, with the the way it is made of sand and, and says that there that simplicity can can be a source of strength, mm-hmm. uh, noting that you can't stab sand. So Polnareff, you cannot beat him. The instant Jojo's saying, ah, you can't stab sand, Polnareff tries to stab the stand. And yeah, he just cuts it in half, but it's sand and it just like... It forms around uh, yeah. Silver Chariot's rapier and he's just stuck. Joe's yeah. just like, yeah, I, I probably can't beat him either. You can't punch sand. What are you going to do if you punch <laughs> sand? Nothing. And we need to consult Spider-Man for tactics, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He's got experience with this. Then, like, after JoJo and, and Avdol are, like, talking about, damn, it's hard to punch sand, it cuts over to Polnareff and Iggy, like, and the fight's already over. Their stands are just gone. Polnareff's just back on the fucking ground, and Iggy's just chewing, just tearing his hair out again. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately defeated. But there is a way to control Iggy. Iggy wants Scooby Snacks. Very specific Scooby Snacks. He loves coffee-flavored chewing gum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so Avdol uh, uh, goes up to the pilot and is like, hey, you got the stuff? The pilot's like, hell yeah, I do. There's no way we would have <laughs> got him in this in this helicopter without it. So, so Avdol <laughs> takes a piece of chewing gum out of the packet of coffee-flavored chewing gum, gets Iggy's attention, who then runs, jumps, and takes the entire packet, leaving Avdol with a single stick. Yeah. Because he's a good boy. <laughs> he's a good boy. Like, Iggy is so ugly that it almost loops back around to being cute. Some in, in certain shots, at least. <laughs> I love him. I love him. <laughs> yeah, it's the only time so far we've seen Iggy like not be super pissed off. Like he's actually wagging his tail, eating the gum. The whole and that like the package too. He's not. He's eating the whole damn thing. He'll eat that foil paper. Yeah. Love it as long as the paper <laughs> tastes like coffee flavored chewing gum. <laughs> Along with Iggy, the these two guys from the Speedwagon Foundation have brought a whole lot of supplies. Mm-hmm. Every the the gang's just stocking up uh, medical supplies, changes of clothes, a new camera for Joseph to karate chop, <laughs> yeah, a whole bunch of extra water and like fuel for their their like dune buggy that they're driving around in. And as uh, uh, Joseph attaches his uh, replacement hand among these supplies, oh, yeah. he's like, uh, "Hey." Uh, uh, Speedwagon guys, give it to me straight. How's Holly doing? And the answer is bad. She's got two weeks left, they think. Mm -hmm. That 50 days was actually 44, it turns out. Mm -hmm. Uh, He would be so upset to hear that Holly is just lying on tatami mats with with an IV in. And all the doctors have to kneel around her. He would be incensed. They're just, the Speedwagon guys are just not telling him that aspect. Because he would probably spend like way too much speed wagon money on just the best bed possible for her. <laughs> We're going to to airlift an entire American style hospital into <laughs> Japan. <laughs> yeah. They could do it. Just giant Chinook helicopters and steel cables. <laughs> <laughs> Speedwagon Foundation is loaded. So also while they're getting all these supplies, because they've got a, a new 
camera with them. They actually just use the camera for its intended purpose, and they just take a group photo. It's adorable. It, it's great. Everybody's being very much, you know, them, themselves. You know, JoJo is just sort of like stern and... He, he is in the group, but you can tell he doesn't want people to think he wants to be in the group. While yeah. in the bottom, Polnareff and, and Joseph are, are doing goofy poses. Yeah, like Joseph's just smiling right at the camera, holding Iggy, who also is smiling for the picture. Because he's a good boy. Because he's a good boy. And uh, yeah, Polnareff is like holding J- Joseph's face like by the chin. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's a later part of Stardust Crusaders where you actually see this Polaroid. But in the manga, you never see when it's taken. So this part is an anime original to explain where this picture is from. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you see it every episode. It's going to be part of the new ending. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I love this photo. It comes up a couple other times throughout the show. It's it's a cute picture. And like after the photo is taken, you see uh, Jojo, Jotaro, just holding the the photo. He's actually smiling just a little bit looking at it. Just a little bit. A little bit. He, he also smiles a second time immediately after looking at the photo because he's very entertained by Polnareff being chased by Iggy mm-hmm, through the mm-hmm. desert. And so with that, everyone getting resupplied, lear- learning about Holly's status. Speedwagon guys are about to leave, but they, they have uh, one more bit of info to tell the gang. And that's, yes. Uh, yes. hey, one of their spies before getting fucking beheaded spotted uh, Dio with nine mysterious men and women in cloaks clearly stand users and kakuin is really shocked because like wait a minute i know how many tarot cards there are (laughs) where are these other nine yeah acting like the naming convention is like a natural law and not just a convention (laughs) yeah there there wasn't a the star one until a month ago you were there if i remember correctly the whole concept of stands being named by tarot cards was an idea introduced by avdol yes i think which is why it's so strange when it th- is then almost immediately treated as a natural thing, because Avdol's like, I never heard of that. Then how did it get its name? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is no worldly law that says there can only be as many stands in the universe as there are tarot cards. <laughs> but in, in the, the weeks of, of broadcast and Beyond that, the months of publishing, you could forgive a reader for thinking such a thing. So totally. it's nice to have Kakuin like give voice to that impulse. Mm-hmm. Kakuin also brings up the only card left is the world, and I think that might be Dio's. Just guessing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Joseph realizes that Dio must still not be uh, like fully acclimated with Jonathan's body yet. If more stand users are being sent at them, yeah, yeah. Because cause Dio's too conceited and, and too, you know, if Dio could fuck us up right now, he would be doing that. Yeah, yeah. Himself. And Dio, even in whatever sort of state he is, would never retreat. He, he would never give us the satisfaction. So he's still in Cairo. So he must be calling all of these these new dudes uh, uh, to just get in between us and him for, for this last stretch. Yeah. And then we see one of these dudes who's the bad guy from a 90s kids movie about ninjas threatening the community center. <laughs> he does look like that. That's exactly yeah. what he looks like. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's, he's this guy's going to get beat up by Tum Tum. God. Th- yeah. This guy's hair is like the key component of that. He's got like this bandana and, and like short sides, but really long hair on the top. That's like he, he is a blind man walking with a cane, but his senses are so honed and so precise. Uh, he can almost grab a fly out of the air. He's almost as good as Star Platinum. Yeah. He, he like clips a wing off that fly. Yeah. And like, that's just that's just him. That they ain't a stand or anything. He's real pissed at that fly because he knows this somehow. That's the exact same type of fly that caused the gang to realize where Dio was hiding. Mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the fly in that picture. The fact he's so upset at the fly shows that, uh, one, Dio's spies are very good. Mm-hmm. Whatever sort of situation he had going on. I mean, it could be Dio's remote viewing thing. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. And also, nobody realizes that the fact they've spoken to three people that spoke to Dio in Cairo... <laughs> <laughs> is also yeah. evidence that Dio's in Cairo. N- neither team recognizes this. <laughs> yeah, it's that the fly is the key piece in all this. <laughs> but while he was not able to grab the fly, he's able to kill it. He flicks a stone with his cane and it just rockets through the air like a bullet and collides with the fly and kills it. Very cool. 
Very, Very cool. cool. Should mention that uh, this only one person in in the group is aware of the stand user at the moment because he's just up on the the cl- the higher up like plateau where those ruins are that we mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. uh, and it's Iggy. He can just smell him. Yes. Iggy doesn't do anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have a, a chewing gum? Yes or no? Hmm. It's the only thing Iggy cares about. Yeah. So the, the fool and Iggy got so much hype at the beginning, but now that we see uh, uh, the fool's stat card uh, uh, at the midpoint of the episode, total trash. <laughs> its highest rank in anything is a B, and everything else is a C or a D. <laughs> He's a, he's a trash stand by the stats, which is why stats don't matter. Why do you give them? They, who cares? You got you to gotta have like the G.I. Joe thing where if you have action figures, you have their stats on the back of the blister pack or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> back back to the action. Uh, all of our heroes are riding in their, their off-road desert capable vehicle. In the earlier parts, I was wondering why. Why don't they just trade with the Speedwagon people? They can all take the the helicopter, and the speedwagon mm. people can just drive. It's not ideal for them, but the fate of the world is at stake. Mm-hmm. Was there a remark made earlier in the episode where somebody was just like, "Oh, I, I am not getting in a helicopter just because every mode of transportation has just been annihilated so far." I don't think so. I don't think there so. definitely was one where uh, uh, somebody's like, "Hey, are they going to give us a ride?" And Joseph's like, "No, these are not stand using speedwagon guys. They are are fragile and they they cannot come with us." Right? Yeah. They don't have to come with you. You can trade the keys. Hmm. Like the helicopter seems like a great idea, but also, damn, I can imagine a helicopter getting fucked up immediately <laughs> in this show. Regardless, they're bombing around. Iggy is in the backseat. So three burly husky dudes are in the <laughs> trunk. <laughs> yeah. Including Polnareff, the burliest of them all, who's very unhappy. <laughs> like you, you get a shot just seeing all of them in the back in one shot and i have no idea how they are physically actually fitting in there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're too big even kakioid is a big boy iggy is presenting problems to the group dynamic clearly but Mm. i think iggy is the perfect candidate for being incredibly trainable like he's obviously intelligent very food motivated and a (laughs) rescue dog We, we didn't mention it but like iggy's backstory is he was a stray on the streets of new york and avdol corralled him (laughs) Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Avdol did what the all the dog catchers of New York couldn't and, and uh, uh, got Iggy off the streets. I just love the idea of Avdol just hearing about an uncatchable stray dog and thinking like, that dog might have a stand. <laughs> hmm. My time has come. Gotta fight this dog. Uh, uh, of course, we cannot train Iggy. Uh, d- despite uh, the fact that those three factors mean he- it would be very easy to, d- despite <laughs> the-, the number of bad behaviors you'd want to work against, because the last thing Joseph needed to be the perfect fussy grandpa yes. was he needs to fawn over an awful dog that hates everyone and has <laughs> no good behaviors trained. None. <laughs> oh, man. I love Iggy. Uh <laughs> Yeah, while they're driving around in this buggy, they're they're not just driving they're fucking ramping it hell yes they're ramping it over these over these dunes and while they're ramping it they they come to a abrupt stop because hey that speed wagon foundation helicopter that flew off it's crashed yeah yeah there there goes everything i was saying a minute ago (laughs) (laughs) you could see uh one of the guys one of the pilots is out of the helicopter or or rather sticking out of one of the windows Mm -hmm. uh dead he tried to claw his way out with his bare hands that does mean his fingernails have torn off oh yeah in the grooves that he he clawed basically in in this like steel fuselage it's Mm -hmm. fucking nasty it's nasty fingernail damage that's a bad one for me that's a bad one Eyeball damage, also bad. Also, his mouth is full of water. <laughs> yeah. They go to assess, like, what, what's happened here, and water starts pouring out of this guy's mouth, and it is so much water. There's a there's fish, a fish. There's, there's a, a fish. fish in that. He's got fish lung. Not a lung fish. That's different. He's got fish lung. <laughs> and this is, like, I think the first thing in all the Stardust Crusaders that seems to genuinely freak Jotaro out. Yeah. <laughs> The the idea of drowning on dry land, not just any dry land, but the desert. Like Jotaro actually like puts his 
hand over his face like he's too freaked out to look at this. <laughs> But the other Speedwagon guy, he's still alive. He's He was thrown further from the helicopter. He looks he's... pretty fucked up. He honestly looks like he's becoming man jerky. Like he, he is yeah. somehow so dehydrated over, what, an hour maybe tops? <laughs> yeah. So they, they go to assist the, this still living guy. And there's a canteen near him full of water. The, this guy, all he can do is just mutter the word water. So they're like, hey, okay. We got some. Let's give it. Need a drink. God, the way JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and Stardust Crusaders in particular so far works is that there anything could be a threat at any time in any given way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so just like the context of what things are and what they do, it, it's impossible to build tension. Like the, the coffee cup could bite your face. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So what it is, is it's all the, the framing techniques and the sound design that clues you into where the danger is going to come from. Mm-hmm. And, and so this canteen is the most terrifying <laughs> thing on earth. Yeah, like Joseph is is lifting this guy's head up a bit. He's going to give him a sip of the water from the canteen. The camera slowly zooms in on this guy's face, just bug-eyed, terrified, and it just alternates between zooming on in on his face and zooming in on the black void inside the canteen. Uh-huh. And then there, oh my God, the, I wanted to make a note on the gore, <laughs> but all I could write is Jesus Christ in all caps. <laughs> I just have to remember yeah. what that means. And I do because it's memorable. Oh yeah. Right before a real bad thing happens. <laughs> The Speedwagon <laughs> Foundation guy is able to sh- say a full sense, and it's, the water attacked us. Mm-hmm. And as he says that, fucking the water in the canteen shoots out. It forms a clawed hand and grabs the Speedwagon dude's face, pulls so hard. And his twists. Face There's stretches. a twist. <laughs> yeah, and twists. And it pulls this guy's face so hard that his whole fucking head gets ripped off his body and then pulled into the canteen. This huge arc of arterial spray, like fucking, I don't know. (laughs) Honestly, it follows the same arc as in The Little Mermaid when Ariel flips her hair (laughs) and in all the water droplets in silhouette. Yeah. Yeah. But it's blood. It's the blood of a man. It's the blood of a man. And, like, all the blood gets sucked up into the canteen. Thank God the gore gets censored sometimes. I don't want to own the, the Blu-rays that, <laughs> that take away all the dark shadows. I, I need them. Yeah, th- this is one of the ones where it's like, yeah, I, I've seen enough. I don't want so more that. of that in my life. <laughs> and so as that happens, everyone goes, oh, fuck, and they run away. <laughs> They run away, they hide behind some dunes, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're really close to the buggy so they could make a getaway. So we're in it now. It's stand fight time. We have to find the user. So so Jojo picks up the binoculars with Star Platinum at his side and starts like scanning the horizon for 360 degrees. I wish, I wish so much that he had passed the binoculars to Star Platinum. Yeah. (laughs) That that, would have been cool. Like, how much magnification is that? If you use, combine those two things together, like, (laughs) it's like a fucking space telescope or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's scanning and he can't find shit. It's just desert. Uh, And they they try to think like, oh, is this like some bullshit? Like when we fought the sun, is he just right here, just disguised? But they again, they can't see anything. It's it's just desert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so while they're just trying to figure out what to do, the, the gang's kind of split up here, so Kakuin and Polnareff are together, and the rest of the gang is, is further away by the buggy. And so Kakuin tells Polnareff to, like, hey, go st- stab it. Cut it up. Cut, cut that it, canteen cut, up. Cut it up. Go. And Polnareff's like, uh, I don't want to. This is freaky shit. You do it. You, you got a ranged attack. And Kakuin just says, but I don't wanna. <laughs> yeah. Just use your Emerald Splash. I don't want to. No. <laughs> And so he he gets karmic justice for his cowardice. Yeah. Because the stand comes out and rakes his eyes, uh, uh, possibly blinding him for life. Yeah. Because he's are... a little chump that said, "I don't wanna." Yeah. Like the 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 claws go r- like right over his pupils. Like he's fucked up. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, the instant he gets slashed, slashed up, he's like bleeding from the face and the eyes, and he is just passed out. Kakyoin is out for the whole fight, mm-hmm. and th- this causes everyone to realize, oh shit, the stand wasn't hiding the canteen. The stand is the water itself. Yes. And this is the, like, conceptual idea of this fight that I find really interesting. When you're in the desert, uh, especially because this is how we experience the world, in media set in the desert, what's the most important thing? Water. Mm -hmm. You have to find water. Water is life, as we all know. But now, water is death. Water is the most dangerous thing. The the safe thing, you know, the the sign of deliverance and survival is now your extermination. Awesome. Love it cool you yeah. can map this same idea to other biomes i guess you know what what is the thing that you lack in the woods but require for survival shelter what if the shelter wants to kill you you get that's why there's so many cabin in the woods stories in in the horror <laughs> genre yeah it's the yeah. exact same flip yep yeah i really like this fight a- everything that happens in this fight is None of it feels like an ass pole like some of the other stand fights do. Everything that happens is like a cool twist, but also like a pretty logical thing to do in the fight. I like mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. The clawed water hand has appeared again out from the sand, and it's right next to Polnareff now. And it's a the the hand has struck a pose that's like it's about to just pluck Polnareff's fucking eyeballs out of its out of his face or something. Yes, yes. And just as it's about to do that, because it's like a foot away from him, there's nothing he can do. But one of the Speedwagon guys, his watch starts beeping, and that causes the stand to dart away to instead sever this man's hand off of his body. (laughs) Yep, yep. Uh, uh, Cut the guy's hand off in order to cut the watch in half to silence the watch. Yeah. So everybody looks at each other. They realize... He wasn't going after the, the guy's hand. He was going after the noise. It hunts by sound. Mm-hmm. And then they say this to each other out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as they realize this, Polnareff picks up the unconscious Kakuin. He just starts running. Everyone else has like started to climb up onto the top of the, the buggy just to get off the fucking ground. And so Polnareff is darting over there. The, the water stand is super fast, faster than Polnareff can run. And he is only saved from getting, like, his feet just cut clean off by uh, Joseph, who just grabs both of them with Hermit Purple and yanks them up with his vines. And and now we start to see our enemy stand user friend from far, far away, who is just sitting on the ground, uh, uh, one knee up, with the, the tip of his cane pressed into the ground and the mm-hmm. handle pressed against his ear as, like, sort of a... A sound antenna, I guess, a, yeah. a listening device, because his his senses are so honed that from kilometers away, he mm-hmm. can uh, uh, follow their movements just from, you know, their, their footprints and things like that. And this, like, also, you know, recalls the image from old Westerns of, of the frontiersman sticking his bowie knife into the ground to, mm. to listen for the train or the cattle stampede or whatever. Yeah. So the gang is talking about how they they just got to try to drive real fast. Yeah. (laughs) Outrun the stand because Kakui is bleeding a lot. He he might be blinded permanently. They really need to get him to a doctor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Iggy's fucking napping in the Yes. He gives no shits. All of our like bonus frames for this episode goes into either just horrid gore or funny dog business. <laughs> Yay. Because, like, Iggy wakes up from his nap, jumps up to the car window, and sort of scrambles over because he didn't quite, you know, make it in the first jump. It's so, like, charmingly and fluidly animated. Yeah, yeah. I love it. When he jumps out of the buggy, he just walks away from the 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 car and just kind of lays down and you know decides to chill out maybe take a nap and right after that happens the water stand forms underneath one of the tires of the buggy and causes it to start sinking into the stand and everyone Mm -hmm. gets real pissed at at iggy because he knew the attack was coming and didn't tell them by barking but immediately they're just screaming about almost falling in everyone's clinging on for dear life and freaking out except for jojo who has one hand like on the rear bumper uh, as it tips vertical and the other hand just <laughs> in his pocket. He's chill. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. Duel here. He's he's able to realize that Iggy jumped out before he attacked and that Iggy might actually be aware of what his stand is doing, even when it's like 
un- underground in the sand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's starting to think, maybe I need to take that dog out first until he realizes the dog is a sh- an asshole and is just going to sleep. And so he's just like, I'll just leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody else kills the dog first. You're, you're just following, yeah. you know, the, the <laughs> it's part of the employee handbook. <laughs> So as the car continues to get sucked down, that, that's our cliffhanger, and we get the first instance of the new ending. Oh, yeah. Th- this is our first instrumental ending, and we, we basically get a sideshow of all the, tr- uh, the chill travel moments that we don't see in the main mm-hmm. action, because the main action is the action. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this song that's playing is called Last Train Home. It's by the Pat Metheny group, which is like a, it's a, it's a jazz band from like the late late 70s early 80s something like that that fits yeah it's a super chill song i like it a lot uh very different mood and energy from all of the other jojo endings so mm-hmm. far it's so relaxing but yeah i i really like the the mood of it i like the look of it a lot because it's just scrolling from right to left like all these different locations they've been to and are going to and the characters doing different things in each little vignette here but also the time of day keeps changing so the colors are like kaleidoscoping the whole time slowly Mm -hmm. it's nice and it ends on jotaro in the desert walking away and the wind blows into frame uh the the picture the group photo they took together yeah so that brings us to episode 26 iggy the fool and gebs and duel part two I did check that uh, uh, title again, because shouldn't it be Ndul's Geb? But it's not. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is. They just couldn't resist the, the very rhythmic rhyme, I guess. It feels good to say, yeah. So yeah, it starts off right where we left off. Mm-hmm. The buggy, it, it was sinking into the sand. The the water stand like darted around and sliced all of the tires in half. Mm-hmm. So now everyone's been thrown onto the sand and everyone's just sitting there like dead quiet. Like we can't do shit or else they'll know, this guy will know where we are. Uh, Avdol sort of communicates with a look to everybody that he's got a plan and he begins employing audio camouflage. (laughs) Yes. As we described so long ago when Avdol was introduced, uh, he he wears a lot of like heavy, a, a lot of metal bracelets up mm-hmm. each arm so he's begun taking them off one by one and tossing them ahead in order to uh, uh give the impression that he is walking very slowly very quietly trying to hide his footsteps yeah and so this works uh, uh our enemy stand user is interpreting the these uh, uh impacts as slow careful steps and is like oh i got you you think you're walking so quiet but i got you now <laughs> yeah i think there's a couple times throughout this episode where you actually see like the way he visualizes this stuff mm-hmm. a- anything where there's no activity is just this really cool blue and any any sounds happening on rever- reverberating through the ground are just like these hot bright pink areas of activity yeah they, they visually represent uh his hearing through like the the visual language of night vision goggles or or yeah or an infrared camera yeah so yeah, the, the stand appears, it's a couple feet in front of Avdol here. As the, the stand is materializing, Ndul starts thinking like, wait a fucking minute, why did he only take five steps and stop? <laughs> so he is uh, uh, saved at the last moment by his paranoia. As soon as the stand comes out, Ndul has the second thought and evades, so uh, he only gets a glancing blow from Magician's Red, which does show up on his own arm as uh, uh, some pretty severe burns around his elbow. Yeah, and unfortunately, Avdol also got hit by that by the stand dodging his fire punch, uh, so he's cut real bad across the neck. Yeah, he in that exchange, he got the much worse side, and damn it, he's only been alive for like three days. <laughs> Come on. So yeah, he is like floored. He is on the ground. He's breathing heavy. And this, the water stand is just looming over his face, looking like he's about to do the same thing he did to the one speed wagon dude. He's just like grab his face and tear it off. Jotaro leaps into action, just starts sprinting. Yeah, yeah. If this <laughs> is what caution gets us, I'm just going to run. Yeah. 
th- this draws Ndul's attention and he's like, mm, okay, the, the footsteps are uh, this far apart. That tells me he's 190, no, 195 centimeters tall. Mm. But he also runs with the confidence of a young man. That must mean it's not Joseph, it's Chocha. <laughs> yeah. You did your homework, dude. <laughs> yeah, this, this dude's fucking studied up. And thank you for the confirmation that both Jojo and Joseph are six foot four inches and yep. three quarters of an inch, if you want to get technical. <laughs> the dudes are huge. Yeah. And he decides, okay, I'm going to abandon trying to kill Avdol and, and go after Jotaro because mm, if there's anything that would make Dio real happy, it's killing that specific guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the strongest of the Jojos. Iggy is just napping. He don't care. He's being left alone because he's just a little puppy. Mm-hmm. For once, being a dog means you don't get violently attacked. <laughs> the I don't know time, what this yeah. is. Uh, but he does get violently attacked by our hero. <laughs> Yay. Who picks him up and like grabs him and shoves his face in the desert. Like that, that's not how you train a dog. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't actually teach them to locate enemy stand users. That, it's really outdated <laughs> advice. Yeah. Also, Iggy looks totally different now. He has a different face. Oh, yeah. Yeah, already. His eyes are a little different. His face is, is shaped a bit differently. He's a little less ugly now. Yeah, uh, according to uh, uh, the, the comment in the, the little Blu-ray uh, commentary, there are four Iggy designs they use. Mm-hmm. They, they use one for the previous episode we talked about, one for this fight, yeah, one for the next half of the second season, and then a fourth Iggy design for the final quarter of Stardust Crusaders. Several years ago... Uh, I got as a present the the figure of old Joseph from part three. And Mm -hmm. he also comes with a little figure of Iggy who has interchangeable heads with the different face face designs for Iggy. (laughs) (laughs) So so fight Iggy is jowlier. Yeah. He's got a bigger, saggier mouth. He he does look more like OVA Iggy for for the fight. Yeah. So yeah, Jotaro here has, has grabbed Iggy and yeah, squishing him up against the ground and going like, you, I know that you can tell where the stand is. Fucking tell us and like help out. And he does this by just trying to scare the shit out of the dog. Yes. Because uh, Iggy is just like sweating, l- staring at the ground because he knows the stand is coming up to get them any second. Mm-hmm. So he tries to flee by materializing the fool in a, in a new form. Yeah, it's a glider now. Yeah. There are big old wings that come out of its rear tires. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he, he leaps up into the air and he's using his stand to just carry him through the air. While doing this, he also makes a decoy Iggy out of sand. He can do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As Iggy tries to glide away, Jotaro leaps up and grabs onto this hang glider stand and <laughs> it just hitches a ride. This is the new status quo that the fight has become after this, this flurry of activity. We, we now uh, go back into to settling down and, and, and planning our next steps as uh, Jojo and Iggy are, are gliding straight toward Ndul, who has to try to figure out what just happened and how to defend against it. The fool does not have propulsion. It is just gliding, yeah. so it keeps getting lower and lower and lower. So there's sort of like a, a as soon as they touch down, the stand's going to find them. So so there is a ticking clock there. Why not use dog farts for propulsion? <laughs> I mean, Iggy is freaking out to the hurt during the whole this whole beginning bit and like farting a bunch, but it's, it's just not quite enough. We just point the boot and and use Newton's third law to get a little extra <laughs> lift. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's this ticking clock element here. They're gliding too low. They're going to hit the ground. So Jotaro has no choice but to materialize just the leg of Star Platinum to, k- to kick off real hard to get more air. Yeah, yeah. Which is cluing in duel into what's happening. Oh, shit. They're flying right at me. So, yeah, he, he knows what they're up to, where they are, and, and I guess could guess when they're going to get there just based on I heard them here and then here do a little mm-hmm. mental math uh, uh, if they maintain that same speed etc but he cannot reach them and that's the important thing yeah they're, they're too high up I also wondered if like a giant noise like that huge thumping uh, kickoff could like allow the others to, to do something in the, the sound shadow I mm. guess that, that would be cast that doesn't yeah. come up and uh, any activity they get up to is already explained by 
jo- uh, Jojo pulling the stand so far away because he's just a much tastier target. But yeah. it's an interesting thought, I-, I thought. Yeah, his stand is still still chasing them. He's now able to kind of hear where they are in the air by the sand that's hitting them or something. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is such a good fight. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Like one really cool element about it is that the, the stand user and the stand each have their own abilities and are using them in concert in an interesting way. Like, I think yeah. it's more interesting that they do that than that, oh, the, this water claw stand hunts by sound. No, the stand user does because he's blind, but he hears just so fucking good, you know? Yeah, it's really neat. But but also it just really exemplifies the structure of a stand fight. It's something totally batshit happens, then you, you explain the basic mechanic, test some edge cases, and now we are up to the step where we demonstrate that the opponent has developed their own tactics in case anyone ever got this far. <laughs> yeah. In Duel has able to kind of figure out where they are in the air via like detecting them with the, the, the sand that's scattered around. Mm-hmm. He, he's able to launch his little stand high enough into the air to pierce through one of the wings of Iggy's stand, causing it you know, to start to descend. And Duel starts laughing because he knows that uh, Jotaro will probably get fucked first because Iggy just wants to save himself. Yes, yes. So Iggy's just starting to like drag Jotaro on the ground because he just wants to get away away from this. I mean, Iggy is so self-centered that he can speak... But the only word he can say is Iggy. Yeah, that's right. He just this says This dog's his a own fucking name. Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, he just says Iggy. And the first time it happened, which is right around this moment, I was not sure. Am, am I hearing this right? Am I am yeah. I reading this subtitle correctly? No, it comes up later. The dog just says Iggy <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, the difference between the English and Japanese dub is funny here because in the English dub, if I remember correctly, Iggy is just kind of like a guy go, like with kind of a growly voice, just like doing dog noises. Yeah, something like that, yeah. In the Japanese dub, it's clearly a woman voicing Iggy. <laughs> uh, the tone of Iggy is very different between the two. Mm-hmm, it's got mm-hmm. like this gruff growling and then this really high-pitched like yipping growling <laughs> in the Japanese one. But yeah, in Duel, now that J- Jotaro is just getting dragged along the, the ground here, time to just, you know, strike the finishing blow on Jotaro here. But then Jojo demonstrates that he is a two-sport kind of guy. <laughs> Not just a sumo fan, but also real into baseball. <laughs> oh, yeah. As Star Platinum picks up Iggy by the face, and then with picture-perfect, like, beyond idealized form, pitches it straight at Endul. <laughs> yeah. As like, the dog this... does 3,000 somersaults in midair, constantly screaming. Yeah, Iggy is has been pitched at, like, 120 miles an hour or something. <laughs> he is rocketing towards Endul. And Endul is immediately freaking out, like, what the fuck just happened? So, something's flying at me. What the fuck is this? And Jojo just says, I threw Iggy at you. <laughs> And so Indul has no choice but to just wait and defend himself because he doesn't know what the fuck is happening until right before Iggy's about to hit him. Just before Iggy is about to collide with him, he materializes his stand, takes a big swipe at Indul. Mm-hmm. You know, Indul's able to block with his stand, but that means he's had to recall his stand right next to him. Yeah, he's now sitting in a puddle. That's like defense position for, for yeah. the stand. And he was so occupied with Iggy rocketing towards him that he's completely lost track of Jotaro. <laughs> Who was, <laughs> last we mentioned, 400 meters. That's a quarter mile away. Yeah, that's a hell of a pitch. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> As Indul's trying to figure out, like, where the fuck did Jotaro go? Uh, the camera pans around him and Jotaro is, like, one step behind him. Like Michael fucking Myers. He's just <laughs> there. Yeah. Just accept it. I guess he jumped. He he Star Platinum jumped the whole way. <laughs> Maybe. Star Platinum's strong enough. He must be able to do like a Hulk style jump, right? He just hasn't tried yet. <laughs> he has now and landed super softly. <laughs> so so as uh Newell recognizes that uh, his enemy is right behind him. Uh he he has reached for his cane that got dropped and is then like you're right here. I d- I don't need my my sound antenna. So so he just lets it drop, and it's this like it's the anticipation is what it is. There there is yeah. no reason for this cane hitting the ground to be the signal that that each of them 
basically quick draw at high noon their their stands yeah. but that's exactly what happens and it feels so right it's it's really good the, this bit is animated very well too like the instant the the in slow motion the cane hits they both go to attack each other in the and... instant before it hits like they both strike yeah. out before it hits the ground it's a replay of i guess the, the mutual strike between uh the, this stand uh geb we might as well say it it's in the episode yes. title <laughs> It's Geb, yeah. Get between Geb and uh, uh, Magician's Red, but with different results because you know Jojo saw that, so he knows which way to dodge. Mm. Uh, uh, so Jojo just gets his hat knocked off, whereas Ndul gets his whole shit rocked. <laughs> yeah, he gets punched like in the chest, real fucking hard, and <laughs> he's he just gets fucked up by this. And as he goes, like, damn, I am fucked. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jotaro starts to... Oh, is that uh, who that is? I didn't recognize him without the hat. <laughs> Wait a minute. This looks a lot like Jonathan now. <laughs> What's Jonathan doing in this school uniform and with hey. such unruly hair? That's not like him. <laughs> and before Jotaro can even try to like get info from Indul, he uses his own stand to drill through his own fucking brain. Still alive, but... And then JoJo starts to ask questions. Like, dude, he liquefied his brain. He's not going to answer you. Like, in duels, it's like, oh, you thought you were going to get any type of info from me? Fuck that. I will die for Dio. Mm-hmm. He even mentions that, like, well, well, now you can't use Hermit Purple to see what's inside my brain if I destroy my brain. Like, Joseph's going to be very surprised to hear he could be reading minds all this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and as as Indul is dying, Jotar is asking him, like, why the fuck are you so loyal to this asshole Dio? Mm-hmm. And Indul just says, like, I am not scared of death. My stand has let me live, like, a life completely without the fear of death. I can mm-hmm. win any fucking fight. Like, there is an element of determinism. Like, when you get a stand, what are you going to do? Get an office job? Yeah. Like, no, you're going to... You're going to live using this this advantage of your stand. And because of the way so many stands are, that means you're going to be a criminal or an assassin or something. Like, I, I guess forever could have lived a life in the merchant marine, but that's not an option open to everybody. Yeah. And Indul explains, like, Dio was the first person to make Indul feel like he wanted to live for something he again like with many other people in the show dio's just too hot yeah he does call him beautiful several times yeah and so you you just gotta live for this guy damn look at him he inspired some something in him it kind of comes across as you know dio was the really good guidance counselor that Endul didn't have <laughs> in school yeah i like the idea of dio as just you know just that one teacher that really got you <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is a little like flashback you see while in duels explaining this stuff of like being taken under dio's wing and in the very corner of the shot very small you get to see enyaba again mm-hmm. <laughs> She's it's me there. i exist <laughs> <laughs> and in duel says you're only gonna get one bit of info out of me my name's in duel and i you know my stand hails from egypt home like birthplace of the tarot so his stand is not named after the tarot but uh, one of the nine gods of Egypt, Geb. Uh, specifically, the, the Egyptian Aeneid. Those are the yeah. nine gods worshipped at Heliopolis. Mm-hmm. Uh, Heliopolis, a city that is now, that, that land is now part of Cairo, a city with many, many square miles. Cairo's a big, big fucking city. Yeah. I, I'm glad they narrowed it down to a specific pantheon of gods. Yeah. Because if you just say Egyptian gods, you've got so fucking many. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah. so many like there's there's a temple just like three miles down the road that had their own like set of, of nine or ten with some overlap and some unique like come on mm-hmm. but yes geb is god of the earth of vegetation fertility earthquakes and snakes geb is unique among the ennead for never having a temple of his own oh poor geb damn so as and Duel explains you know, himself and his stand. Uh, you, you see his spirit start to leave his body and his, his water stand dries up and disappears and he's dead. And Jotaro actually takes the time to bury him mm-hmm. and mark his grave with his cane. Because they had a nice heart to heart at the end there. 
Yeah. About how Dia was the first person to, to finally get through by saying, you can do this. You're just not applying yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and as like the sun is setting now, and as Jotaro is, is walking away from this, this grave he has made, uh, he's just kind of leaving Iggy behind. <laughs> Yeah, they they have a heart to heart actually. Yeah. Like JoJo speaks more about emotions with this dog than any human being in his life. Yeah, and you know what? I can relate. It's fine. I get it. Yeah, but he he's trying to level with Iggy. Like, man, I don't know you. You you don't want to be here. We're dealing with people stuff. You're a dog. I get it. There, there is a sense that he might be talking a little bit about his own, you know, sense of being wrapped up in a family destiny that he never recognized as his own family until 31 days ago. <laughs> yeah. And he does try to make amends with Iggy by... He, he has one stick of coffee-flavored gum. He mm-hmm. offers it to Iggy. Iggy freaks out. He has a fit. There's, a, there's something wrong with this dog. There's probably a lot of things wrong with this dog. He is... Yeah, he's having a conniption over this this gum, then yeah, runs he's... away around the corner. Like, okay, see if see you never. B- bye bye. But wait, Iggy comes back and he's being a nice little dog. He just left to go get Jotaro's hat. Oh, he brought it back to him. And Jotaro puts on the hat, and it turns out it's a, he's been a bad little dog because it's full of the mushed up gum that's now in his <laughs> hair. Yeah. Thank God it's just the gum. You know. Thank God it's just gum. Yeah. Like when you see something brown all over that you're like wait a minute and this is when they get rescued uh the the dune car is coming at them in reverse does it only work in reverse now (laughs) i guess they patched up the tires just good enough to to make the four kilometer journey yeah and yeah the credits in this episode come in very early because there is a long post credit scene there's a whole sequence yeah this is, this reminds me of the episode where they, they drive to Switzerland. Like, the credits should have come with the drive before they get to Switzerland in part two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, after the credits, we, we start this extended uh, uh, sequence with a child with very tall hair reading Oingo Boingo magazine, a thing that probably never existed. I can't imagine it did. Yeah, specifically, it's called Oingo Boingo Brothers Adventure. Yes, and uh, uh, some random guy just approaches this kid reading this Vacation book. Goku. His name Vaca- is Vacation, yes, Vacation Goku. Vacation Goku. That's exactly what this guy looks like. He's got a fanny pack. This is Vacation Goku who borrowed Vegeta's pink shirt. Yes. <laughs> the- <laughs> and tore the, the, the patch off the back because he's not a bad man. He's a nice man. Yeah. So this guy approaches this kid who, it, it, he's reading a comic book, this Oingo Boingo comic book. And uh, it's just like, oh, is that a comic book? I've never seen that one. It's, I, I, I'm really interested in Egyptian comics. <laughs> Want to trade for some of my mini donuts? He's a, a, a world traveler who's interested in, in comics and art yeah. from around the world. He, he loves short run, local, hard to find mm-hmm. stuff. With a trade for mini donuts, he gets this book, and it is drawn in something similar to the style used for the tarot card art. Yeah. Flat colors, very grotesque, uh, uh, misshapen proportions and and, uh, body parts, a whole lot of just bangles and doodads hanging off of random parts of characters and and environment. While the book clearly says Oingo Boingo on it, it gets relocalized in the English dub to Zenyata Mandata. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is, especially if you're listening to the Japanese dub, if you didn't realize that all these names were like actual real musician and band names before, you will definitely notice it here because they, in the Japanese dub, are constantly saying Oingo Boingo. <laughs> <laughs> While you're reading Zenyatta and Mandata. Yeah. I would love to read a full story drawn in, in this style, in this mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. I bet it'd be some cool shit. Vacation Goku opens up this comic book and goes like, wow, the art style in this is really weird, but it's really great print quality. It's in full color. He's just marveling at this comic book. And he, he starts reading this this book about these two brothers named Oingo and Boingo. Mm-hmm. I don't know which one is which because I'm so used to them being Zenyatta and Mandata, the two <laughs> brothers in the story. Uh, but there's a little one who's lonely and won't do, is sad and won't do anything unless his bigger brother is around. Vacation Goku re- keeps reading this book. And hey, in the comic book itself, it brings up how the, the little brother one day met a traveler 
who was interested in this little kid's comic book and traded him his binoculars and mini donuts for it. Wait a minute. And then he winds up dead uh, with his face impaled on a telephone pole. Yeah. The end. The end. That's the whole comic book story. Vacation Goku is reading and just like sweating, just going like, what the fuck is this? (laughs) That's weird shit, kid. This is a weird ass book. And then he starts flipping through the rest of the comic book and all the pages are blank. There's nothing on them. This is a half blank book. Yeah. So he gives it back and is like, well, that's, that's weird. Uh, anyway, I got to take my tour bus to the next part of my globetrotting trip. Or, I, or first he tries to buy the comic book off of this kid because he's so fascinated by it. Yeah. And then this kid's much bigger, much older brother uh, appears and, and just intimidates him, saying this book is not for fucking sale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the guy runs off, boards this, this bus. The, the little brother shows his bigger brother like the comic book. The bigger brother's looking at it. It's like, oh, that's what's going to happen? I guess we can't fucking help that. That sucks for that guy. Uh, Let's take the next bus. Let's take the next bus, yeah. and Because they've got to go where they're told by Dio to meet, uh, you know, the Joestar group. Mm -hmm. As they are on a different bus going by the the, the first bus that has now crashed, Vacation Goku has died and is impaled on a telephone pole. He somehow, like, this bus was going fast enough that when it crashed, uh, Vacation Goku flew through the front window and got his face pierced through by the, like, the the metal brackets that are the the footholds for, for, like, linemen to to go up and down. Yeah. 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 It's grisly. It's bad. Oh, yeah. And with that, that's the end of uh, this episode. This this is a good one. This is a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think every fight from now on is a good one. <laughs> this reminds me a lot of what I was saying on the, the last fight, the, the way it just, like, it follows the, the format and, and delivers based on, you know, the strength of that format. But I think it does it better because Duel is more of a character, uh, has his mm. own stand independent abilities, whereas Rose is just a lady in a dress, and that's fine sometimes, but if you're yeah. if you are comparing them, which is a thing I said not to do in that episode, but if you do <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this one comes out ahead. hmm Yeah. Oh, I should bring up this is a stand user that actually gets named, like, oh, who's he he named for? He's named for a Senegalese singer. So this is another yeah. one that could easily fly under the radar because not particularly popular in the US. Yeah, I think his name is like Yusu Endur, Endur or something like that. Not so much a localization thing as a L to R uh, uh, switch. Yeah. As things go from one language to another to yet another. Like in Africa, he is like one of the the most famous like musicians there. I really like that we've gotten with with Indul, like we're getting some musicians referenced that aren't like the usual type. <laughs> non Western. Even Polnareff's a bit unusual. <laughs> I mean Polnareff too, yeah. I don't know. I like it when they pull out the the references that are like, I have to look this up, like who is this person? Yeah. Not just British and American guitar boys from the seventies and eighties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, Iggy is just, you know, Iggy Pop. Because mm-hmm. he pops his gum. Yeah. Y- yeah? Yeah? Maybe? Whoa. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Iggy is a... Iggy something. I think... <laughs> Iggy responds to a need, I think, to, to break up the group, to, to add a new element, to jostle them out, out of their... Out of, you know, settling into, into their groove. But... Yeah. The elements that make up Iggy feel like they were rolled on a, a random generator table. Yeah. His name is Iggy. He's a roll dog who likes to <laughs> roll, tear chunks out of people's hair. And when he does that, he roll farts. I guess he farts. And his favorite yeah. thing to eat is roll coffee flavored, roll chewing gum. <laughs> he was found in roll New York. <laughs> Yeah. And let's see. Uh, I'm going to roll a D5 to see which of you met him first in New York. Oh, it's Avdol. Okay, cool, cool, cool. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Iggy, I guess I wouldn't say he's on the same like level of importance as the rest of the group, but Iggy does get some growth throughout the second part. <laughs> so, And that's fun when that happens. So in the first half of Stardust, with the, the previous uh, opening to each episode, there is a hint to Iggy in that. There's that shot early on in the opening where you see uh, the five stars representing the group like, right, right. in the sky and they fly into the horizon. Right at the like last half second or second of that shot when the stars shoot off 
into the horizon, really far off to the right, just barely in frame, is a sixth star representing Iggy. <laughs> <laughs> he showed up late. It's not his fault. He's a dog. Yeah. He, he doesn't have an alarm clock. If he did have an alarm clock, he'd get killed by Geb. Yeah. But yeah, I like that they put a little hint that there's going to be one more, like, ally party member Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. much later on the fool though i mean i'm sure we haven't seen all of what the fool is capable of but Mm -hmm. as a stand so far it seems like a an interesting mix of very early and now midpoint uh uh, stardust crusader stands right like yeah he's a big thing that punches but he also has this additional power of like sand control and and limited or perhaps not so limited shape shifting. I'll see. I guess. Yeah, he's like a he's a punch ghost plus. You know, mm-hmm. we're only doing two episodes for this podcast. We could have done the next episode because it's a one parter, but but we decided to pay off on a promise made in our very first episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this two parter is the fight that is very heavily copied in the. You JoJo can say Bizarre. the P word. I, I plagiarize. This is yeah. straight up plagiarism. Yeah. In in the comic we brought up, the Western comic Diesel, which just straight up plagiarizes tons of elements from JoJo. The the way it does is so interesting and strange to me. Uh, so so Diesel came out in 1997 by by Joe Weltjens, uh, doing basically the whole thing himself, uh, uh, mm. script and art. Uh, I think he even did his own inks, like. Yeah. Is one issue of what is clearly meant to be a further series, but it, it never made it to a second. So so let's just talk uh let, let's talk about Diesel. Let's recap Diesel the same way we do our episodes. Yeah. We open on a big old splash page of a giant palatial mansion with a huge ass fountain. Like this mm-hmm. this is wealth, this is power. Uh uh-uh. and then inside, uh this hugely ornate room like fucking versailles ass dining room uh (laughs) is entered by the blue hulk (laughs) yeah yes (laughs) this is yeah this guy just punches clean through a wall takes out two guards that that were on the 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 other side of this wall the blue hulk is the stand of this plain ass looking blonde dude Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pants a shirt a coat that's all I can do to describe this man. <laughs> and yeah, he is. This guy is clearly supposed to have like star platinum as a stand, but it's like, what does star platinum look like in like late nineties Rob Liefeld inspired? Yeah, you know, yeah. Like art th- style? this is this is if star platinum was Lobo, basically, or yeah. or or drawing from the same music and fashion scenes Lobo did instead of the weird glam shit that star platinum does. Yeah. And Leather pants, frankly, Vegeta-ish hair. <laughs> He's got a widow's peak <laughs> oh, yeah. and everything. <laughs> yep. And, you know, like a lot of Western art in, in comics around this time, very sinewy, very veiny. Yeah. Lots this, of lines. This is late 90s. This is post-Liefeld. This is just what every yep. book looked like. Well, superhero book, at least. Yeah. And so this guy with the blue Hulk, blue Lobo Hulk platinum... <laughs> walks into this room and is confronting this other blonde man but with longer hair who is dining and he just sets down his his wine glass because he's not afraid to know ghost and then we cut three months earlier it is nighttime in the same mansion yeah this this guy who is dining is is now talking to this other man in a suit (laughs) it's so hard to describe these guys they're just guys (laughs) A slightly older man. Yeah, he's he's a Ving Rhames type. He he's a a, a muscular, bearded, bald black man of, of middle age. This rich blonde haired villain is named Botha. Yes. Botha these nuts. Yeah. <laughs> like that. That's how you spell it. But these two were having some type of meeting. The older yes. man is apologizing for, for bothering Mr. Botha. Uh his name is Mr. Evans, and something that uh, is so irritating is that the speech bubbles are not colored in. I hate this shit. It's, Why does this happen sometimes? It, it's not illegible. It just looks bad. It just yeah. looks bad. Yeah. Like, especially Mr. Evans's speech bubbles that you can see the building through. It, it's not so bad when they're just talking against the sky or the silhouettes of, of the trees in the estate. But it's just, yeah. 
it looks ugly. Anyway, Mr. Evans says some things that Mr. Botha doesn't like, and Mr. <laughs> Evans's stand c- cuts him in half as his parts fall in the pool. Yeah, just after Mr. Evans was saying, like, this is a nice pool. How much did it cost you? I want this pool. <laughs> Anyways, so now that Mr. Evans is in half floating in the pool, uh, let's go to Great Britain. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> the way this book works, the, the way this book came about is a, a fairly well-known story. I think we even hit the bullet points back in our first episode. Uh, the, this comic writer, artist, editor, jack of all comic trades, uh, saw a fan-subbed copy of the, the JoJo's OVA in, in the mid-90s, which starts at the Endul fight, mm-hmm. and, and was inspired to make something cool like JoJo's. So if you're making something like JoJo's, especially if your first introduction is, <laughs> we're just some guys in a desert, here's a dog that does magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dropping people in the deep end and then eventually answering questions as you build to a big conclusion. That makes sense. And mm-hmm. it's a great way to like, oh, here's some a bunch of unanswered questions in issue one. You're going to want to buy issue two. That never happened. I get it. But it's so fucking disorienting in the end. <laughs> yeah, it's it doesn't an- it, it, it raises so many questions to somebody. If somebody didn't know what Jojo was, they picked this up and read it. It, it, it answers so many fucking questions and answers basically one of them kind of they would look back at the the cover and be like okay is there an issue zero is is what 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 do i need to know i read a decent amount of comics but mainly just manga and so going back to a a western comic panel layouts are different but mm-hmm. also, especially because like I read a lot of like Archie published stuff, like the Sonic comics and the Mega Man comics back in the '90s and early 2000s. It's weird to read a comic that is that format again when there is so much more fucking narration through rectangles in every goddamn panel. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say blood. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and also the panel layout is like way different compared to like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the way panels are laid out in, in manga a lot of the time. But there's just so much like. There's way more word bubbles. There's way more narration through rectangles in every panel. It drives me nuts. So uh, uh, we're, we're seeing the, the guy that we saw three months in the future. Yeah. Uh, he, he's coming home uh, uh, after a long absence to, to this pretty nice house in the woods of Britain. And mm. as he's walking up the steps from the dock, I, he sailed there. It is a riverfront house. <laughs> He's accosted by a, a younger blonde man in a baseball <laughs> shirt who has an electric stand. And yeah. this stand also follows very much the tenets of late 90s you know, comic book costumes. You know, he's electric because he has cables going from his chest to his limbs. Uh, he has a, a, a visor and a chin strap. The most unique thing about this design is he has his head is covered by sort of a headscarf. Yeah. But, you know, cyber boots and knee pads, the whole deal. Oh, yeah. This blonde man in the baseball shirt is telling this blonde man in the not baseball shirt, like, (laughs) hey, I sense that you're a Stan user. Don't, you know, fucking identify yourself. Don't move a muscle. And they they get into a brief confrontation where he starts shooting lightning at Blue Hulk. Who Mm -hmm. who punches the lightning. (laughs) Who punches the lightning. So Blue Hulk arrives or, or, or is sent out with the, the sound effect Vree Choom. <laughs> There's a lot of the sound effect Choom in this comic. Uh-huh. And this was long after Obama's Choom gang had dispersed. I don't know. <laughs> may- maybe maybe Joe was part of it. <laughs> yeah, we get, a, we get to see a, a full body shot of Lobo Hulk now. And yeah, he's just shirtless. He's got random black straps over his forearms. He's wearing... Leather pants with boots that got little tassels on them. Yeah, punches the lightning. Oh no, the blonde guy's arm gets burned. So so this is how we communicate that what happens to stands happens to the user. Okay. It, in his thought bubble, the blonde-haired man without the baseball shirt says, Not bad. He's young and cocky, but he's got quite a stand. Electric. The simplest are the strongest. Hmm. Who said that? That's the first line said about stands in the JoJo OVA. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh man so they, they're they squaring off for, for round two uh, uh, when there is a whoom and a third stand pops out of, of this sound effect of whoom and it's 
seems electric, some sort of yellow crackling energy coming from between the hands of this... A boob ninja? A boob ninja. Like It's th- just a boob ninja. She seems to be made of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, th- this is a balloon animal. Like everything on her is <laughs> bubbles. Her shoulders yeah. are very interesting. <laughs> yeah, the the shoulders are the same size and shape a- as the boobs right below them. Yes. So it looks like she's a four boobed ninja woman with arms growing out of the top side of boobs. Like. <laughs> uh, but the the user is a, a, a young woman with uh, her hair in buns. She's wearing a devil's shirt because. She's a New Jersey hockey fan, I guess. Mm. Uh, and she has a dog. She has Crypto the Super Dog. <laughs> it's just fucking Crypto. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, white dogs of that breed all kind of look the same. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and now now we finally get some names. Uh, baseball shirt young stand user is named Joseph. Uh-huh. Thomas is this newcomer who will eventually face down Mr. Botha in three months. Yep. Chewbacca is the name of the dog. And, and this woman is named May. We will eventually learn that May is uh, Mr. Evans's daughter. And yeah. they imply that, that that was also, like, Thomas's dad. Like, yeah. Mr. Botha killed both of our dad. It's not clear whether that's two separate murders or one. Yeah, it's phrased strangely. Like, Thomas and May are very close. That could be we were raised as siblings or we used to date, but it's cool now. Like, yeah, I, mm. that's what issue two would have been about, I guess. Whoops, doesn't yep. exist. <laughs> so after the, the like the full page panel of the boob ninja stand being introduced and May as well, the next panel is her like yelling at Joseph, telling Joseph to take it easy. And this one panel looks a little anime. It, I was going to say it looks very archy, but maybe that's just his Actually, haircut. No, it does look a little archy, too. Yeah. It, it, I guess it's more May's face and like the little yeah. thunderbolt cloud yes, over her yes. head that feels kind of more anime inspired. The next panel it switches right back to like post Liefeld art. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there, there's a happy reunion now that Thomas has met somebody in this house he actually recognizes. Yeah, and then May introduces Thomas to all of her other stand using friends: Alex Oliver, uh, Jet Li, <laughs> spelled L E E, not to be confused with Jet Li. <laughs> Uh-huh. And Azizi, who uh, Azizi. who does know Tommy. They they uh, uh, have a bit of a reunion. I don't know how closely any of these other characters are based on the characters of Stardust Crusaders, but Azizi yeah. is very clearly uh, Avdol-inspired. Yeah, his hair and stuff. Like Yeah, yeah he, he has the hair spikes. He, he seems to come from the same or similar ethnic background. Mm -hmm. Uh, also being one of the hero's old friends. And we'll get to what his stand does later. Like, Azizi (laughs) is Avdol. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, there's this reunion of these like childhood friends and stuff. And Thomas is like, hey, what's going on? Why why is everybody here? And this is when he he learns that May's dad is dead. Mm -hmm. Also his dad? I don't know. And so they decide to talk about this more hours later at night at the pier. <laughs> well, maybe it was almost sunset. You don't know. You maybe. don't know. <laughs> maybe I can't really tell in these these panels. And so the May and and Thomas are talking at the, at this pier. She says, "I want Thomas's to talk about." Thomas's chin grows huge. <laughs> yeah, he gets way more chin in from this part onwards. Part, part of <laughs> a, a JoJo tribute is to have your character designs evolve and change. Sometimes yeah. that's between page one and page eight. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. May sits down at the pier, tells Thomas here, I want to talk about Ryuo, asterisk, little box lower in the panel, Dragon King. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, don't we all? Don't we all want to talk about Ryuo, Dragon King? I've been waiting for somebody to to indulge me. Let me talk about Ryuo, asterisk, Dragon King. So, So the reason that Thomas was kept in the dark is because if he knew the news, he would immediately rush out and, and seek revenge, whereas May's plan is, no, you would die immediately. None of us are, are strong enough. That's why we need to be a, a, a team. There's yeah. six of us. One of us is the dog, I guess. Yeah, and she's saying, like, you know, he'll fuck you up. This guy killed my father and yours. Separate dads, I guess, but it could also be read as same dad. If, if I were to write the second issue, it would be that, like, uh, Thomas was taken in by the Evans family as, as a young child yeah. and, and May is his sister. Yeah. Not necessarily where Joe was going, but maybe where Joe was going. Uh, maybe. And the next page here, 
uh, the camera focuses in on the woods surrounding this this house, and we see a guy sitting on the ground in the exact same goddamn pose in Duel was one leg tucked in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with his uh, uh, shades that suggest blind man, and his cane planted in the ground, listening to the the squared off handle. However, this is where we get the biggest difference between this character and in Duel. <laughs> He does not have a stand made of water. He has a stand that is his own blood. So he uses his sharpened claw-like uh, uh, nails to pierce the, the his own palm to, yeah. to send out blood. This is fucking metal, dude. Yeah. yeah. So now it's the next morning. People are, like, getting breakfast. Uh, Joseph is already out in the woods patrolling. He's worried about stand users. He steps in a puddle of blood in the forest and doesn't notice the blood. I mean, this makes sense. Joseph was uh, patrolling the dock and and nearly killed his good friend and new ally, Thomas. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The, the dog Chewbacca starts barking up a storm so they know something's wrong so they, they follow him into the forest and oh no Joseph's laying on the ground surrounded by blood he's hurt but it's not his blood it is the enemy stand that begins attacking them and it grabs twists and pulls off Joseph's head yep and like we should mention that th- these aren't just stands and how they function they are literally called stands in the comic like, yes yes as soon as the head pops off thomas screams enemy stand <laughs> i i love this panel He'll look at his fucking face look at his chin jesus <laughs> while there was concern for joseph earlier it, it's there's just too much happening now that J- joseph's head is rocketing through the sky Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, fuck him. We got to worry about ourselves. I love the top panel of the next page, which is just Joseph's head staring immediately at you, the viewer, mouth wide open in shock, looking back at his hand in the foreground from from where his body is. Yeah. Uh, May gets stabbed through by by this blood stand as soon as, you know, she steps on a twig that snaps. And that Mm -hmm. lets her figure out that this stand hunts by sound. Oh. Now that she's injured, she gets picked up by Thomas, and they're running away from the blood sand that's cutting up trees. It slices off Alex's feet. Both feet at the ankles. <laughs> yes. Very, very, almost the same injury. No one here had Hermit Purple to save him. <laughs> yeah. And so Jet Li sends out his stand, which looks like a Rob Liefeld version of Megabyte from Reboot. <laughs> That's what it looks like. This is a cyber man. Not, not to all my Doctor Who friends out there, but no, a, a man that is cyber. Yeah, he's got weird antenna ears. He's purple and green. I guess he's supposed to be Hierophant Green, maybe? He might have his own abilities, but one of his abilities is to send out grappling fingers to to yeah. swing around like like Tarzan. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's the only ability we see it uh, uh, use. Yeah, and so so we get Alex out of danger, not fast enough to save his feet, but out yeah. of danger. <laughs> Azizi is staying behind while everyone escapes to fight the blood stand. He calls out his stand, which is... Ju- this is a robot Go. from Pat Labor. This, yeah. This, this is this an is Ingram. Pat yeah. It just looks like an Ingram. Uh, uh, slightly more westernized Ingram, I guess. And it shoots fire out it of its hands. It shoots fire out of its hands at the blood, which gives this, the enemy stand user the exact same birds that Endul got. And he's like, oh, man. That's a cheap trick. I recognize this as the Black Templar stand because I did my homework on these people. I'm going to yep. have to be more careful. And so everyone else is escaping with the, the their wounded friends and getting in a car to drive away. We got the dune buggy here, kind of. While Thomas stays behind with the dog. Mm-hmm. He uses the dog to track the stand user, not by throwing it, unfortunately. <laughs> No. Just regular, like, lassie shit, you know, take me to Timmy in the well. Thomas realizes that his footprints are, are, his footsteps are making a trackable amount of noise. So he kicks off and flies in the arms of his uh, uh, yet unnamed stand Mm -hmm. and leaps forward about a hundred yards to the stand user who then realizes that, you know, he, he needs to do some sort of AOE attack, summons the blood up in a ball, and just sends it out in a massive attack, which is something we don't see in the anime. Yeah. But is present in the OVA. Oh. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. 
th- this ball that shoots out uh, hyper fast, you know, blood bolts omnidirectionally is in the OVA. It, it's something oh, that it, it is a way that Geb is used against the 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 fool glider. I like in this page the the first couple of panels are this guy strategizing and all this, and it feels like it wasn't planned how much he was going to be thinking here. Because there's no rectangles or dialogue bubbles, just the text floating on top of stuff, and it's a little hard to read. And it just, like, starts in the margins and then leaks into the panels like there wasn't enough room. Yeah. It looks like crap. It looks bad. At least Thomas's thought bubbles have a background to them so they don't get lost in the foliage. God, yeah. He and his stand get hit by the blood rain, but he's, he's fine. He lands... He decides to start making distractions of noise by, like, punching a bunch of trees over. In a pose that was was liked so much, it became the cover. Yeah, yeah. While it, the, the dog here was not thrown at him, the dog does leap at the, the guy from behind and gets cut across the throat by the blood stand, distracting him long enough. Diesel has even more dog violence than JoJo's. You hear, you yeah. heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For that and, to be the one, like, uh, yeah. uh, digression, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that's enough to distract him so that he doesn't know where Thomas is. And he Thomas is right behind Thomas the guy. Thomas is immediately behind him as he is kneeling in a puddle of the blood in, you know, defense position. Mm-hmm. So Thomas' stand punches uh, this in duel alike straight out while uh, uh, the blood bolt goes wide in exactly the same way. <laughs> Yep, Thomas tries to get info out of him, but he can't because the guy dies, but he doesn't kill himself. Rather, he gets stabbed clean through by a new stand, which is just a, a ninja lady. It's called Shybot. Yeah, Shybot. Or maybe and, the user is called Shybot because he's a businessman in a trench coat who is not uh, uh, Mr. Botha. This is a brunette man with a goatee. Yeah, and he's just standing on a tree branch and says, sorry, Thomas, I can't explain You've passed the first test. And that's the end of the fucking issue. That's the end. That's the end of the whole series. Story, pencils, inks, colors by Joe Welchins. I love this thing. It's rare to see something like this that is so blatant in its plagiarism. And the, the way the plagiarism moves as a wave between the big picture and the little picture, right? Yeah. What stands are, how they work, what they're called, absolutely taken. Yeah. The midground of what these characters are after and what motivates them and how they're connected to each other, like the actual story you're telling, completely new. Like that yep. that's not from Stardust Crusaders at all. But then the fine points of like beat by beat, every single element of how this fight plays out, just photocopied. Yeah, like it almost feels like like the Power Rangers and how all the fights were taken from <laughs> yes. Super Sentai stuff and then all the teenage stuff in the middle in between the fights is new. Yeah, yeah, like this has a legacy. Like, uh, uh, And Joe Welchins was absolutely right when he read this in 19... 19- uh, when, when he watched the OVA in, in 1996 or 97, saying that there's no way that this is going to get on TV. The, mm-hmm. Nobody's going to license this for, for an American mid to late 90s audience. So let, let's share it with the world by making it cool. But there's there's tribute and there's theft, dude. Yeah, like... S- Saban licensed that shit. Like, come yeah. on. Like, if there was some, you know, comic that started in the late 90s that was heavily inspired by JoJo but became its own thing, that'd be really cool to read. This is just, like, fuck. Like, where, where were we with anime in America around 97? Like, uh, you could show the the moody, violent shit, like, at nights on the sci-fi channel. Like, Vampire yep. Hunter D was on TV at this time. Yeah, the only other, like, big anime things uh, aside from that... Dragon Ball Z was just blowing up. Yeah, Dragon Ball Z on, like, UPN, I think, at the time. The the other big things were, um, I think it was... One of the, the, the big channels would air Sailor Moon. And one of the other big channels, I think ABC, would play uh, Ronin Warriors. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And those were, like, the only, like, kid anime things at that time before Pokemon hit. And that you know, like open the gates for everybody. Yeah, but the the JoJo OVA being six episodes, mm-hmm. a US TV licensor is going to look at that like, I, I can't put six episodes into syndication. 
Yeah. I need 50. I need 50 yeah. episodes. <laughs> yeah, I still have never actually watched all of the OVAs of Stardust. I, I need to do that sometime. But man, I almost wish I could. I had an actual copy of this. <laughs> I, 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 I am so entertained by, the, by this thing. So, so Joe Welchens, he is still with Antarctic. He spent a number of years as editor-in-chief Okay. Uh, Antarctic Press is a small press comics publisher. I mean, anybody but the two are going to be small uh, in, yeah. in that industry. But their line seems to be making things where they know exactly how many they're going to sell before it even gets announced for, for solicitations. Cheesecake books, including uh, some furry titles and, mm-hmm. and political parody that doesn't seem to take any side. You don't know if it has a point. Like, oh man, I hate that shit. We're talking like a uh, robot chicken style. Everybody can enjoy this. We uh, uh, yeah. we <laughs> filtering of of current events into parody. Yeah. So I just went to their uh, their page to see like what they're putting out right now. Some of these I'm pretty sure must be pretty long running because I remember seeing these in the comic book store like as an eight or nine year old. Oh yeah, they got some long running stories. Specifically, Ninja High School mm-hmm. looks very familiar. Oh yeah, they're still se- selling like the back issues of the stuff from the late '90s. Holy shit! Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ninja High School and also uh, Gold Digger are are the two like things I almost always bought and then never did as a kid because they looked anime, but I had enough of a nose back then I could tell that it wasn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was how to draw manga style shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seeing some of these covers and like instantly recognizing them is pretty crazy. They also have a thing that is called Steam Wars that is just Star Wars with, and they just hit backspace on the Star Wars font and just typed in Steam instead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, there's a comic here called Cat Shit One. Oh man, these uh, first two episodes here, going back to those, are it's it's such a strong start for the second half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely one of the fights that's higher up there for me in the for, in the second half, but there's there are ones that are even better, and th- th- there's basically none that's like fucking I can't remember the name of the tarot card anymore. The car one, Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune. How could I forget that? There's how nothing could you here remember it? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like Wheel of Fortune in here. They're they're all really solid. The end of the second episode here with the the very long post credits scene already kind of giving you an idea of what the next fight might be like, sort of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even compared to the other fights that happen here, is a very unique one. I can't wait for these people to punch some kids. Oh, yeah. Time to punch that kid. All right, then. To be continued. See you later, mate. 